who first realized that air has weight. It was actually a mathematician named Evangelista Torricelli who is the first on record to demonstrate that air has weight. His experiment to prove this fact was prompted by the observation that water from a mine shaft could only be pumped upward to reach a certain height. Torricelli thought that the air pushing down on the surface of the water must play a role. To test this theory, in 1643 he placed a sealed tube of mercury upside down in a bowl of mercury. He observed that the weight of the air would keep the mercury in the tube at a certain level. And on different days he observed that the mercury would rise to different levels. We now know this is because the air pressure varies from day to day. And Torricelli's experiment was the first barometer. Who first realized that air has weight? It was actually a mathematician named Evangelista Torricelli who is the first on record to demonstrate that air has weight. His experiment to prove this fact was prompted by the observation that Water from a mine shaft could only be pumped upward to reach a certain height. Torricelli thought that the air pushing down on the surface of the water must play a role. To test this theory, in 1643 he placed a sealed tube of mercury upside down in a bowl of mercury. He observed that the weight of the air would keep the mercury in the tube at a certain level. And on different days he observed that the mercury would rise to different levels. We now know this is because the air pressure varies from day to day. And Torricelli's experiment was the first barometer. Who first realized that oxygen gas, O2, was required for fire. Philo of Byzantium in the 2nd century B. CE was the first to observe, or at least the first to record such an observation. That if you placed a jar on top of a candle with water around its base, some water would be drawn up into the jar as the candle burned and eventually went out once all the oxygen was consumed. Although the experiment was well designed, he ended up with an incorrect conclusion about the process. Robert Boyle repeated the experiment but replaced the candle with a mouse. Seriously, and noticed the water also rose up the container. From this experiment he correctly inferred that whatever the component in air was. He called it nitroeros, it was needed for both combustion and respiration. Robert Hooke, and others, likely produced oxygen gas in the 17th century. But didn't realize it was an element as the phlogiston theory, see below, was in vogue at the time. So to really realize that oxygen gas was required for fire, it first had to be, well, discovered. Who first realized that oxygen gas, O2, was required for fire?
Philo of Byzantium in the 2nd century B. CE was the first to observe, or at least the first to record such an observation. That if you placed a jar on top of a candle with water around its base, some water would be drawn up into the jar as the candle burned and eventually went out once all the oxygen was consumed. Although the experiment was well designed, he ended up with an incorrect conclusion about the process. Robert Boyle repeated the experiment but replaced the candle with a mouse. Seriously, and noticed the water also rose up the container. From this experiment he correctly inferred that whatever the component in air was. He called it nitro arrows, it was needed for both combustion and respiration. Robert Hooke, and others, likely produced oxygen gas in the 17th century. But didn't realize it was an element as the phlogiston theory, see below, was in vogue at the time. So to really realize that oxygen gas was required for fire, it first had to be, well, discovered. What is the theory of phlogiston? In 1667, a scientist named Johann Joachim Beecher introduced the theory of phlogiston as an explanation for the various observations scientists had made regarding combustion. These observations include the fact that some objects can burn while others cannot. And that a flame in a sealed container can go out before the combustible material is consumed. Beecher proposed that a weightless, or almost weightless, substance called phlogiston was present in all materials that could burn and that this phlogiston was the substance being given off during combustion. If a candle placed in a closed container went out, Beecher said this was because the phlogiston from the candle was moving into the air and that the air could only absorb a certain concentration of phlogiston before it became saturated and could no longer absorb more phlogiston from the candle. Another tenet of this theory was that the purpose of breathing was to remove phlogiston from the body. Air that had been used for combustion couldn't be used to breathe then because it was already saturated with phlogiston. What is the theory of phlogiston? In 1667, a scientist named Johann Joachim Beecher introduced the theory of phlogiston as an explanation for the various observations scientists had made regarding combustion. These observations include the fact that some objects can burn while others cannot. And that a flame in a sealed container can go out before the combustible material is consumed. Beecher proposed that a weightless, or almost weightless, substance called phlogiston was present in all materials that could burn and that this phlogiston was the substance being given off during combustion. If a candle placed in a closed container went out, Beecher said this was because the phlogiston from the candle was moving into the air and that the air could only absorb a certain concentration of phlogiston before it became saturated and could no longer absorb more phlogiston from the candle. Another tenet of this theory was that the purpose of breathing was to remove phlogiston from the body. 
air that had been used for combustion couldn't be used to breathe then because it was already saturated with phlogiston. How was the theory of phlogiston disproved? Antoine Lavoisier, an 18th century French chemist, disproved the theory of phlogiston by showing that combustion required a gas, oxygen, and that that gas has weight. Lavoisier did this by burning elements in closed containers. These solids gained mass, but the total weight of the containers did not change what did change was the pressure inside the vessel. When Lavoisier opened the vessel up, air rushed in, and the total weight of the vessel increased. So Beecher had it backward. Oxygen was being used up by the candle instead of phlogiston being given off by the flame. How was the theory of phlogiston disproved? Antoine Lavoisier, an 18th century French chemist, disproved the theory of phlogiston by showing that combustion required a gas, oxygen, and that that gas has weight. Lavoisier did this by burning elements in closed containers. These solids gained mass, but the total weight of the containers did not change what did change was the pressure inside the vessel. When Lavoisier opened the vessel up, air rushed in, and the total weight of the vessel increased. So Beecher had it backward. Oxygen was being used up by the candle instead of phlogiston being given off by the flame. How was oxygen gas first discovered? Well, to answer that question, you would first want to know who first discovered oxygen. And there is no simple answer to that question. There are three people to whom discovery of this can be ascribed. Carl Wilhelm Scheele, Joseph Priestley, and Antoine Lavoisier. Scheele produced O2, he called it fire air, from mercuric oxide, HGO. In 1772, but the result wasn't published until 1777. Meanwhile, in 1774 Priestley produced O2, he called it deflogisticated air. Using a similar experiment, which was published in 1775, Lavoisier claimed to have independently discovered the gas and was in fact the first to explain how combustion worked via quantitative experiments. Leading to the principle of conservation of mass, and ultimately disproving the entire idea of phlogiston. Leo. So Scheele found it first, but didn't report it, Priestley reported it first. But didn't have the explanation correct, and Lavoisier was last, but nailed it. Who would you give credit to? How was oxygen gas first discovered? Well, 
To answer that question, you would first want to know who first discovered oxygen. And there is no simple answer to that question. There are three people to whom discovery of this can be ascribed. Carl Wilhelm Scheele, Joseph Priestley, and Antoine Lavoisier. Scheele produced O2, he called it fire air, from mercuric oxide, HgO. In 1772, but the result wasn't published until 1777. Meanwhile, in 1774 Priestley produced O2, he called it deflogisticated air. Using a similar experiment, which was published in 1775, Lavoisier claimed to have independently discovered the gas. And was in fact the first to explain how combustion worked via quantitative experiments. Leading to the principle of conservation of mass, and ultimately disproving the entire idea of phlogiston. So Scheele found it first, but didn't report it, Priestley reported it first. But didn't have the explanation correct, and Lavoisier was last, but nailed it. Who would you give credit to? What is electrochemistry and how was it discovered? Modern electrochemistry studies reactions that take place at the interface of an electronic conductor and a source of charged ions, possibly a liquid. The development of electrochemistry began with studies on magnetism, electric charge, and conductivity. The earliest experiments typically focused on questions surrounding properties of materials. For example, which materials can be magnetized and which materials can be charged. As early as the 1750s scientists had discovered that electrical signals were important to human life and were using them to treat medical issues such as muscle spasms. In the late 1700s, Charles Coulomb developed laws describing the interactions of charged bodies, which are still used widely today and taught in any introductory course on electricity and magnetism. The first electrochemical cells were developed during the 1800s. Electrochemical cells are arrangements of electrodes and sources of ions that either generate electric current from a chemical reaction. Or alternatively, use electricity to drive a chemical reaction. Today these cells find applications in daily life. Such as in the batteries that power your car or cell phone. Today electrochemistry still constitutes an important field of research and is one. That will likely continue to lead to the development of new products and technologies. What is electrochemistry and how was it discovered? Modern electrochemistry studies reactions that take place at the interface of an electronic conductor and a source of charged ions, possibly a liquid. The development of electrochemistry began with studies on magnetism, electric charge, and conductivity. The earliest experiments typically focused on questions surrounding properties of materials. For example, which materials can be magnetized and which materials can be charged. 
As early as the 1750s scientists had discovered that electrical signals were important to human life and were using them to treat medical issues such as muscle spasms. In the late 1700s, Charles Coulomb developed laws describing the interactions of charged bodies which are still used widely today and taught in any introductory course on electricity and magnetism. The first electrochemical cells were developed during the 1800s. Electrochemical cells are arrangements of electrodes and sources of ions that either generate electric current from a chemical reaction. Or alternatively, use electricity to drive a chemical reaction. Today these cells find applications in daily life. Such as in the batteries that power your car or cell phone. Today electrochemistry still constitutes an important field of research and is one. That will likely continue to lead to the development of new products and technologies. When did the theory of the atom come about? The idea of the atom was originally proposed by ancient scholars. The philosophers Democritus and Leucippus are often credited with proposing the early notions of the atom. Including the ideas that many different kinds of atoms exist. That there is a substantial amount of empty space between atoms. And that their properties are responsible for the properties of materials we see and interact with. For centuries, ideas about the structure and properties of the atom were based. Largely on conjecture and logical arguments. And it wasn't until the 1800s that experiments began to allow atomic theory to advance to where it is today. How do herbal medicines differ from modern medicine? Modern pharmaceutical medicines usually contain only one active ingredient. Or a few at most. The rest of the ingredients in a pill are there to aid in its delivery in one way or another. Herbal medicines, because they are made from plants that were once living. Can contain many more chemicals, though only one may be the active ingredient in this case as well. What separates ancient and modern chemistry? While there's not a clear, punctuating distinction between ancient and modern chemistry, there are a few major differences that separate the two. Modern chemists describe the world in terms of atoms, molecules and electrons and have a relatively complete understanding of the basic particles that make up matter at least insofar as is necessary to describe chemical transformations. Ancient chemists didn't have this information and relied less on experimental evidence and more on theory and mythology. For example, Ancient chemists sought the philosopher's stone, see below, for which there was no verifiable evidence. But they were attracted to it for its mythological power to preserve youth.
who ran the first chemistry experiment ever. Jaber Ibn Haya N, known as Jeber in Western texts, was probably the world's first alchemist to run actual experiments. Jaber lived during the 8th century in what is now Iran, and like alchemists before and after him, was fascinated by the prospect of changing one metal into another and by creating artificial life. To Aristotle's four elements, J. A. Burr added sulfur and mercury, and proposed that all metals were made of differing ratios of these two elements. He was the first to emphasize the importance of rigorous experimentation, and is credited with describing many common lab techniques and equipment. What did Empedocles believe were the four basic elements? A Greek named Empedocles, who was not from Miletus, but rather Sicily, was the first to propose the four basic elements. These four elements were earth, air, water, and fire. These elements had a much different definition from that which chemists use today, which we'll get to later. Unlike the modern definition of an element, Empedocles' understanding of an element did not require it to be a pure substance. Water, for example, was obviously not the only liquid Empedocles had ever encountered. Earth represented solids, water represented liquids, air represented gases, and fire represented heat. Who first realized that oxygen gas, O2, was required for fire? Philo of Byzantium in the 2nd century B. C. E. was the first to observe, or at least the first to record such an observation. That if you placed a jar on top of a candle with water around its base, some water would be drawn up into the jar as the candle burned and eventually went out once all the oxygen was consumed. Although the experiment was well designed, he ended up with an incorrect conclusion about the process. Robert Boyle repeated the experiment but replaced the candle with a mouse. Seriously, and noticed the water also rose up the container. From this experiment he correctly inferred that whatever the component in air was, he called it nitro arrows, it was needed for both combustion and respiration. Robert Hooke, and others, likely produced oxygen gas in the 17th century. But didn't realize it was an element as the phlogiston theory, see below, was in vogue at the time. So to really realize that oxygen gas was required for fire, it first had to be, well, discovered. What is an element? An element is the most basic form of a chemical substance. If you have an object made of a pure element, all of its atoms have the same number of protons. We'll discuss what this is more a little later, 
and the same basic chemical properties. There are not many objects that we encounter on a daily basis that are actually composed of only a single element. Most things are formed from atoms of several types of elements bonded together. How are herbal medicines prepared? There are many ways of preparing herbal medicines. Tinctures and elixirs are extract ions of herbs using some solvent, usually ethanol. If a plant is extracted with acetic acid, the solution is known as a vinegar, even though the solvent is also vinegar. A tisane uses hot water to extract herbs like tea. What is fire? The chemical description of fire is a combustion reaction. It involves the reaction of oxygen with molecules in some combustible material. The fire itself is caused by energy released by this reaction in the form of heat and light. The fire you see is not only the light that's being released, but also glowing hot gases. What does the city of Miletus have to do with chemistry? Miletus one of the Greeks' greatest cities, was located on the western coast of what is now Turkey and was home to where some of the earliest ideas about chemistry were recorded. During the 6th century BCE, the Milesian school of thought was founded, and the musings of three philosophers survived into the modern era, Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes. Thales thought the most basic building block of the universe was water and that the earth floated on top of this celestial water. Anaximander challenged both of these ideas, proposing that the universe was born when fire and water or hot and cold, separated from one another and that the earth simply floated on nothing. How did chemistry affect trade in ancient times? Ancient chemistry was involved in the production of many goods that were important to trade. These included salt, silk, linen dyes, precious metals, wine, and pottery. How was the theory of phlogiston disproved? Antoine Lavoisier, an 18th century French chemist, disproved the theory of phlogiston by showing that combustion required a gas, oxygen, and that that gas has weight. Lavoisier did this by burning elements in closed containers. These solids gained mass, but the total weight of the containers did not change. What did change was the pressure inside the vessel. When Lavoisier opened the vessel up, air rushed in, 
and the total weight of the vessel increased. So Beecher had it backward. Oxygen was being used up by the candle instead of phlogiston being given off by the flame. What is the theory of phlogiston? In 1667, a scientist named Johann Joachim Beecher introduced the theory of phlogiston as an explanation for the various observations scientists had made regarding combustion. These observations include the fact that some objects can burn while others cannot. And that a flame in a sealed container can go out before the combustible material is consumed. Beecher proposed that a weightless, or almost weightless, substance called phlogiston was present in all materials that could burn and that this phlogiston was the substance being given off during combustion. If a candle placed in a closed container went out, Beecher said this was because the phlogiston from the candle was moving into the air and that the air could only absorb a certain concentration of phlogiston before it became saturated and could no longer absorb more phlogiston from the candle. Another tenet of this theory was that the purpose of breathing was to remove phlogiston from the body. Air that had been used for combustion couldn't be used to breathe then because it was already saturated with phlogiston. How was oxygen gas first discovered? Well, to answer that question, you would first want to know who first discovered oxygen. And there is no simple answer to that question. There are three people to whom discovery of this can be ascribed. Carl Wilhelm Scheele, Joseph Priestley, and Antoine Lavoisier. Scheele produced O2, he called it fire air, from mercuric oxide, HGO. In 1772, but the result wasn't published until 1777. Meanwhile, in 1774 Priestley produced O2, he called it deflogisticated air. Using a similar experiment, which was published in 1775, Lavoisier claimed to have independently discovered the gas and was in fact the first to explain how combustion worked via quantitative experiments. Leading to the principle of conservation of mass, and ultimately disproving the entire idea of phlogiston. Wio. So Scheele found it first, but didn't report it, Priestley reported it first. But didn't have the explanation correct, and Lavoisier was last, but nailed it? Who would you give credit to? Who first proposed the idea of elements? Plato is often given this accolade as he was the first to use this term for his description of the five basic shapes that he believed made up the entire universe. Tetrahedrons, icosahedrons, dodecahedrons, octahedrons, and cubes. He went on to ascribe each shape to a basic element, borrowing from Empedocles, see next question. The tetrahedron was fire, 
icosahedron, water, dodecahedron, ether, octahedron, air, cube, earth. While this association of basic geometrical shapes to the nature of the universe obviously didn't work out for him. Plato's ideas did lead Euclid to invent geometry. What is bronze? Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin that may contain up to one-third tin. Early civilizations used bronze because it could make stronger, more durable tools than stone or pure copper. What fifth element did Aristotle add? Although Empedocles is understood to have been the first to propose the four basic elements. Aristotle is sometimes given this credit. Aristotle did propose a fifth basic element though, which he called ether. Ether was a divine material that Aristotle said made up the stars and other planets in the sky. What is electrochemistry and how was it discovered? Modern electrochemistry studies reactions that take place at the interface of an electronic conductor and a source of charged ions, possibly a liquid. The development of electrochemistry began with studies on magnetism, electric charge, and conductivity. The earliest experiments typically focused on questions surrounding properties of materials. For example, which materials can be magnetized and which materials can be charged. As early as the 1750s scientists had discovered that electrical signals were important to human life and were using them to treat medical issues such as muscle spasms. In the late 1700s, Charles Coulomb developed laws describing the interactions of charged bodies, which are still used widely today and taught in any introductory course on electricity and magnetism. The first electrochemical cells were developed during the 1800s. Electrochemical cells are arrangements of electrodes and sources of ions that either generate electric current from a chemical reaction. Or alternatively, use electricity to drive a chemical reaction. Today these cells find applications in daily life. Such as in the batteries that power your car or cell phone. Today electrochemistry still constitutes an important field of research and is one. That will likely continue to lead to the development of new products and technologies. Where was early chemistry developed? While many civilizations learned how to make dyes and pigments, or ferment fruit into wine. The earliest theories about atoms and what makes up the chemical world came from ancient Greece and India. Lysippus in Greece and Canada in India both came up with the idea that there must be a small indivisible part of matter. 
the Greek word for uncuttable is atomus, clearly the root of the modern term atom. Kanada's term for this similar concept was paramanu or simply anu, the indivisible element of matter. What is the earliest historical evidence of the study of chemistry? Although they didn't call it chemistry. People from ancient civilizations used chemical reactions in many aspects of their lives. Metalworking, including the extraction of pure metals from ores, and then combining metals to make alloys. Like bronze, left many artifacts of early man's chemistry experiments. Pottery, including the production and use of various glazes. Fermentation to make beer and wine, and pigments and dyes for cloth and cosmetics are all Evidence that man has always been fascinated by the ability to change matter. How can a fire be started with a piece of flint? Almost everyone has seen a movie character start a fire using a piece of flint. But you may wonder how this is possible. Flint is a hard stone that can produce sparks when it is struck against a metal, such as steel. The sharp edge of the flint breaks off a small splinter of steel. Which is heated significantly by the friction from the strike of the flint. As this splinter of hot steel reacts with oxygen in the air, a spark is produced. The sparks generated in this way can then ignite a piece of dry wood, paper, or other fuel. Who first realized that air has weight? It was actually a mathematician named Evangelista Torricelli who is the first on record to demonstrate that air has weight. His experiment to prove this fact was prompted by the observation that Water from a mine shaft could only be pumped upward to reach a certain height. Torricelli thought that the air pushing down on the surface of the water must play a role. To test this theory, in 1643 he placed a sealed tube of mercury upside down in a bowl of mercury. He observed that the weight of the air would keep the mercury in the tube at a certain level. And on different days he observed that the mercury would rise to different levels. We now know this is because the air pressure varies from day to day. And Torricelli's experiment was the first barometer. What is metallurgy? Metallurgy is the branch of science that deals with the properties of metals composed of both pure elements and those of mixtures of metallic elements, which are called alloys. It represents one of the first efforts to manipulate and understand how elemental composition of a substance affects its physical properties. What herbal medicines do people still use today?
Aspirin and quinine are probably the most famous herbal. Medicines that have made the transition to mainstream medicine. Many modern medicines were originally isolated from plants. However, but the commercial sources are now usually man-made. For example, Taxol, R, Paclitaxel, was originally isolated from the Pacific yew tree. In 1967 this compound was found to be useful as a treatment for various types of cancer. For almost 30 years, most of the paclitaxel that was given to patients was obtained from the yew tree. Alternate supplies of this drug were developed in the 1990s. Moving this natural drug into the realm of modern synthetic medicines. What is the law of definite proportions? The law of definite proportions says that a substance always contains the same proportions of each element of which it's composed. For example, a molecule of water, H2O, always contains two hydrogen atoms for every oxygen atom. This is commonly understood among modern chemists. But it was an important step in working toward a microscopic understanding of the composition of matter. The first to make such claims, in the early 1800s, was the French chemist Joseph Proust. It was a controversial idea at that time. And other chemists believed that elements could be combined in any proportion. What is the law of definite proportions? The law of definite proportions says that a substance always contains the same proportions of each element of which it's composed. For example, a molecule of water, H2O, always contains two hydrogen atoms for every oxygen atom. This is commonly understood among modern chemists. But it was an important step in working toward a microscopic understanding of the composition of matter. The first to make such claims, in the early 1800s, was the French chemist Joseph Proust. It was a controversial idea at that time. And other chemists believed that elements could be combined in any proportion. What is Avogadro's constant? Avogadro's constant is a large number used to discuss large quantities of atoms or molecules. Usually when chemists talk about quantities they can actually see or measure out. The number itself, rounded at three decimal places, is 6.022x1023. It's just a big number. That relates an atomic or molecular mass to the mass of a collection of many atoms or molecules. Avogadro's number of atoms of an element is called a mole of that element, and Similarly, Avogadro's number of molecules of a compound is a mole of that compound. For example, the atomic mass of oxygen is about 16 grams per mole, and 6.022x1023 atoms, 1 mole of oxygen weigh, s, 
about 16 grams. The most recent, and accurate, definition of this constant was 6.02214078,18. X1023, which was calculated by careful measurements of the mass and volume of 1 kilogram, about 2.2 pounds. Spheres of silicon 28, a particular isotope of silicon, see next chapter concerning isotopes. What is Avogadro's constant? Avogadro's constant is a large number used to discuss large quantities of atoms or molecules. Usually when chemists talk about quantities they can actually see or measure out. The number itself, rounded at three decimal places, is 6.022x1023. It's just a big number. That relates an atomic or molecular mass to the mass of a collection of many atoms or molecules. Avogadro's number of atoms of an element is called a mole of that element, and Similarly, Avogadro's number of molecules of a compound is a mole of that compound. For example, the atomic mass of oxygen is about 16 grams per mole, and 6.022x1023 atoms, 1 mole of oxygen weigh, s, about 16 grams. The most recent, and accurate, definition of this constant was 6.02214078,18. x1023, which was calculated by careful measurements of the mass and volume of 1 kilogram, about 2.2 pounds. Spheres of silicon 28, a particular isotope of silicon, see next chapter concerning isotopes. When was Avogadro's constant discovered? Amadeo Carlo Avogadro published a paper in 1811 describing his theory that a volume of gas at a given temperature and pressure, contains a certain number of atoms or molecules regardless of what gas it is. Avogadro didn't actually determine what that number was, however. It took just over 50 years for someone to make progress on that. Johann Joseph Loschmidt, in 1865, estimated the average size of molecules in air. It's nothing short of amazing that he ended up being off by only a factor of two. Jean Perrin, a French physicist, accurately determined the constant using a few different techniques. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1926 for the work. But Perrin proposed that the constant be named for Avogadro and the name stuck. For more on the use of the constant, see atoms and molecules. When was Avogadro's constant discovered? Amadeo Carlo Avogadro published a paper in 1811 describing his theory that a volume of gas at a given temperature and pressure, contains a certain number of atoms or molecules regardless of what gas it is. Avogadro didn't actually determine what that number was, however. It took just over 50 years for someone to make progress on that. 
Johann Joseph Loschmidt, in 1865, estimated the average size of molecules in air. It's nothing short of amazing that he ended up being off by only a factor of two. Jean Perrin, a French physicist, accurately determined the constant using a few different techniques. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1926 for the work. But Perrin proposed that the constant be named for Avogadro and the name stuck. For more on the use of the constant, see atoms and molecules. Why is chemistry the central science? Chemistry is called the central science because it's related to everything. It connects and draws from topics in biology, physics, material science, mathematics, engineering, and other fields. Chemistry is important to how our body functions, to the food we eat, to how our medicines work, and to pretty much everything else in our lives. After reading this book, we hope you'll agree. Why is chemistry the central science? Chemistry is called the central science because it's related to everything. It connects and draws from topics in biology, physics, material science, mathematics, engineering, and other fields. Chemistry is important to how our body functions, to the food we eat, to how our medicines work, and to pretty much everything else in our lives. After reading this book, we hope you'll agree. What is an atom? Atoms are among the most basic building blocks, making up all matter. The word atom derives from the Greek word atomus, which means that which cannot be split. The existence of atoms, or a fundamental, indivisible unit of matter, was proposed long before modern chemistry and physics came about. It turns out that atoms are actually made up of even smaller particles. But the atom is the smallest unit of matter that defines an element. The smaller particles that make up an atom are positively charged protons. Charge neutral neutrons, and negatively charged particles called electrons. What is an atom? Atoms are among the most basic building blocks, making up all matter. The word atom derives from the Greek word atomus, which means that which cannot be split. The existence of atoms, or a fundamental, indivisible unit of matter was proposed long before modern chemistry and physics came about. It turns out that atoms are actually made up of even smaller particles. But the atom is the smallest unit of matter that defines an element. 
The smaller particles that make up an atom are positively charged protons. Charge neutral neutrons, and negatively charged particles called electrons. What is an electron? The electron is a negatively charged subatomic particle, and it is one of three main subatomic particles. The others being the proton and the neutron. That make up atoms. Electrons are responsible for bonding atoms together to make molecules. And they are also the carriers of electric charges in the conducting materials found in the electronic devices you use every day. While protons and neutrons are both found in the center, or nucleus, of an atom. Electrons are located apart from the nucleus and are best described as a cloud of electron density. Most reactions in chemistry deal with changes to the arrangement of electrons in some form. What is an electron? The electron is a negatively charged subatomic particle, and it is one of three main subatomic particles. The others being the proton and the neutron. That make up atoms. Electrons are responsible for bonding atoms together to make molecules. And they are also the carriers of electric charges in the conducting materials found in the electronic devices you use every day. While protons and neutrons are both found in the center, or nucleus, of an atom. Electrons are located apart from the nucleus and are best described as a cloud of electron density. Most reactions in chemistry deal with changes to the arrangement of electrons in some form. What is a proton? Protons are subatomic particles that carry a positive charge. They are substantially heavier than electrons, roughly 1,836 times heavier. And carry a positive charge equal in magnitude to that carried by the electron. Protons are found in the nucleus of every atom, and the number of protons present in an Atom determines its chemical properties, or, in other words, determines what element it is. What is a proton? Protons are subatomic particles that carry a positive charge. They are substantially heavier than electrons, roughly 1,836 times heavier. And carry a positive charge equal in magnitude to that carried by the electron. Protons are found in the nucleus of every atom, and the number of protons present in an Atom determines its chemical properties, or, in other words, determines what element it is. What is a neutron?
neutrons are the other principal component of the nucleus of an atom, along with protons. The neutron is neutral in charge and has a mass roughly similar to that of a proton. Atoms of the same element that contain different numbers of neutrons will generally still have the same behavior as one another in terms of chemical reactivity properties. Both protons and neutrons are, in fact, made up of even smaller particles. But chemistry doesn't usually deal with these even smaller bits. What is a neutron? Neutrons are the other principal component of the nucleus of an atom, along with protons. The neutron is neutral in charge and has a mass roughly similar to that of a proton. Atoms of the same element that contain different numbers of neutrons will generally still have the same behavior as one another in terms of chemical reactivity properties. Both protons and neutrons are, in fact, made up of even smaller particles. But chemistry doesn't usually deal with these even smaller bits. What were some early models for the atom? Experiments suggested that atoms were actually made up of smaller particles. Which motivated the development of new models involving protons, neutrons, and electrons. One was Thompson's plum pudding model. Which described the atom as a positively charged pudding filled with negatively charged electrons. Rutherford later proposed the idea of a positively charged nucleus. But couldn't explain why electrons didn't just fall into it. A Danish physicist named Niels Bohr proposed the idea that electrons travel around a nucleus. In specific orbits and advanced the atomic theory to a point very close to where it is today. What were some early models for the atom? Experiments suggested that atoms were actually made up of smaller particles. Which motivated the development of new models involving protons, neutrons, and electrons. One was Thompson's plum pudding model which described the atom as a positively charged pudding filled with negatively charged electrons. Rutherford later proposed the idea of a positively charged nucleus, but couldn't explain why electrons didn't just fall into it. A Danish physicist named Niels Bohr proposed the idea that electrons travel around a nucleus. In specific orbits and advanced the atomic theory to a point very close to where it is today. How did scientists determine that atoms consist of electrons, neutrons, and protons? Originally atoms were thought to be the smallest unit of matter. But in the late 19th century experiments allowed scientists to finally probe inside atoms. Some of these first experiments were carried out by the British physicist J. 
J. Thompson, who discovered the electron. He noticed that the rays, actually rays of electrons, though he didn't know it at the time, were deflected by electrically charged plates and concluded that these rays must consist of charged particles that were much smaller than atoms themselves. Thompson's first graduate student, Ernest Rutherford, continued to investigate the nature of the atom. In the early 20th century, Rutherford carried out a now famous experiment in which radioactive particles were shot through extremely thin gold foil. While some bounced off of the nuclei in different directions. Most of the particles actually passed through the foil undeflected. Rutherford interpreted this as an indication that the atoms making up the foil must consist of mostly empty space. Over his career, he developed the picture of the atom as a positively charged center surrounded by electrons. And he also proposed that there must be neutral particles. Neutrons, to explain the different isotopes of a given element. How did scientists determine that atoms consist of electrons, neutrons, and protons? Originally atoms were thought to be the smallest unit of matter. But in the late 19th century experiments allowed scientists to finally probe inside atoms. Some of these first experiments were carried out by the British physicist J. J. Thomson, who discovered the electron. He noticed that the rays, actually rays of electrons, though he didn't know it at the time, were deflected by electrically charged plates and concluded that these Rays must consist of charged particles that were much smaller than atoms themselves. Thompson's first graduate student, Ernest Rutherford, continued to investigate the nature of the atom. In the early 20th century, Rutherford carried out a now famous experiment in which radioactive particles were shot through extremely thin gold foil while some bounced off of the nuclei in different directions. Most of the particles actually passed through the foil undeflected. Rutherford interpreted this as an indication that the atoms making up the foil must consist of mostly empty space. Over his career, he developed the picture of the atom as a positively charged center surrounded by electrons. And he also proposed that there must be neutral particles. Neutrons, to explain the different isotopes of a given element. What is the current model for the atom? The current model for the atom consists of negatively charged electrons orbiting a positively charged nucleus. The nucleus consists of neutrons and protons that are very tightly bound to each other by a strong force. Orbiting electrons behave something like a cloud surrounding the nucleus. And we can't be sure quite where they are at any given time. The electrons are also very lightweight compared to the nucleus, and they move much, much faster.
What is the current model for the atom? The current model for the atom consists of negatively charged electrons orbiting a positively charged nucleus. The nucleus consists of neutrons and protons that are very tightly bound to each other by a strong force. Orbiting electrons behave something like a cloud surrounding the nucleus. And we can't be sure quite where they are at any given time. The electrons are also very lightweight compared to the nucleus, and they move much, much faster. What fraction of atoms are empty space? The fraction of an atom that is occupied by empty space is very large. In fact, over 99.9% .9 of atoms are empty space. The protons, neutrons, and electrons are incredibly small. And the atom occupies such a relatively large effective volume because of the delocalized electron cloud around the nucleus. What fraction of atoms are empty space? The fraction of an atom that is occupied by empty space is very large. In fact, over 99.9% .9 of atoms are empty space. The protons, neutrons, and electrons are incredibly small. And the atom occupies such a relatively large effective volume because of the delocalized electron cloud around the nucleus. When did alchemists finally abandon trying to make gold? In the late 1700s, a scientist named James Price was still hard at work trying to transmute metals into gold and silver. In 1782, he claimed he could convert mercury into silver and gold. At first it appeared that his experiments had worked, but conflict rapidly rose. More and more scientists asked to witness the experiments firsthand. And Price eventually lost confidence in the validity of his own work. After disappearing for a few months, in 1783 he invited scientists to his laboratory to witness his experiments in person, but only a few men showed up. In their presence, Price intentionally ingested a poison, killing himself. He was the last of the modern scientists to claim to have achieved the goals of alchemy. And it is no longer believed that anyone will find a simple way to convert inexpensive metals into gold. What is an electron? The electron is a negatively charged subatomic particle, and it is one of three main subatomic particles. The others being the proton and the neutron. That make up atoms. Electrons are responsible for bonding atoms together to make molecules. 
and they are also the carriers of electric charges in the conducting materials found in the electronic devices you use every day. While protons and neutrons are both found in the center, or nucleus, of an atom. Electrons are located apart from the nucleus and are best described as a cloud of electron density. Most reactions in chemistry deal with changes to the arrangement of electrons in some form. What is a proton? Protons are subatomic particles that carry a positive charge. They are substantially heavier than electrons, roughly 1,836 times heavier. And carry a positive charge equal in magnitude to that carried by the electron. Protons are found in the nucleus of every atom, and the number of protons present in an Atom determines its chemical properties, or, in other words, determines what element it is. What is alchemy? Alchemy was among the earliest practices of a chemical science, and, in a way, it can be considered a predecessor to the modern science of chemistry. Alchemy is somewhat different than a modern science, though, in that it also has roots in mythology and spiritualism. Practitioners of alchemy were known as alchemists. Among the primary goals of alchemists were to find a method or material that could convert inexpensive metals into precious gold, as well as to find an elixir of life, which could make a person both youthful and immortal. Myths told of the existence of such materials and of the possibility of such feats. The goals of alchemists were based largely on these myths. In medieval times, alchemists could be found in many countries around the world. And those in different regions held somewhat different beliefs. In the Western world, people were still considering how to make metals into gold as recently as the late 1700s. How did early chemistry relate to medicine? Early societies all over the world found that certain types of plants could be used for medicinal purposes. Though only relatively recently have people attempted to gain a detailed understanding of the chemistry behind these methods. The overarching reason why these methods work is because a chemical in the plant interacts with the chemicals in your body in a beneficial way. What fraction of atoms are empty space? The fraction of an atom that is occupied by empty space is very large. In fact, over 99.9% .9 of atoms are empty space. The protons, neutrons, and electrons are incredibly small. And the atom occupies such a relatively large effective volume because of the delocalized electron cloud around the nucleus.
How did scientists determine that atoms consist of electrons, neutrons, and protons? Originally atoms were thought to be the smallest unit of matter. But in the late 19th century experiments allowed scientists to finally probe inside atoms. Some of these first experiments were carried out by the British physicist J. J. Thomson, who discovered the electron. He noticed that the rays, actually rays of electrons, though he didn't know it at the time, were deflected by electrically charged plates and concluded that these Rays must consist of charged particles that were much smaller than atoms themselves. Thompson's first graduate student, Ernest Rutherford, continued to investigate the nature of the atom. In the early 20th century, Rutherford carried out a now famous experiment in which radioactive particles were shot through extremely thin gold foil. While some bounced off of the nuclei in different directions, most of the particles actually passed through the foil undeflected. Rutherford interpreted this as an indication that the atoms making up the foil must consist of mostly empty space. Over his career, he developed the picture of the atom as a positively charged center surrounded by electrons. And he also proposed that there must be neutral particles. Neutrons, to explain the different isotopes of a given element. 